also known as the CIP or SIP, as you can see uh, uh, behind me. And today we are very, very happy to have this webinar to hold it because it is especially close to our hearts, both in its thematic and the speakers. So what we will do today in the next hour and a half or so is we will have three presentations. The first one will be about the Caribbean uh, Marine Environment Protection Association, also known by its acronym as CARIB-MEPA, which is, of course, a spin-off. It is the daughter of NAMEPA, the, the North American Marine Environment Protection Association. And we will have its executive director, Ms. Carlene Leiden-Walker, close friend, family, I should say, of the CIP, presenting this at first. Good morning, Carlene, and thank you for being here. Good morning, Jorge, and it is my honor to be here. And besides, anytime Jorge asks, I say yes. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. And then just we're going to alter the order of, of things a little bit. And the second presenter will be a person well known in the Caribbean uh, constituency of the CIP, and that will be Ms. Mona Swoboda. And Ms. Mona will present the uh, disaster Risk Management Project of the CIP. Good morning, Mona. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Jorge. Good morning, Carlene. Pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. I look forward to sharing uh, with everyone our project. I must thank, of course, Paola Beltran for this from the SIP Drip team and pay my respects to Real ID, our technological partner, and Martin Santillanes, Director General, for hosting uh, this event in the, in the, in the Zoom. Uh, welcome to everybody I see on the screen. Welcome to the Port Authorities of the English-speaking Caribbean. I see many of you here. Welcome to PMAC members who I also see here. Welcome to uh, Panama people who I see here. Chile, I see people from Chile. I see people from our associate membership. For instance, uh, Hudson Analytics is here represented. Marita Kramp is, is here. I see friends, uh, friends all. And, and they are joining more and more by, by the moment. So uh, this will be great. As you know, we are going to, after Mona, it'll be my turn and then I will present uh, the, what we've worked on and you guys know about it, the SIP Green Port Guide. And I'll talk much more about it then. Um, this is a SIP, uh, uh, the Port Guide is already in the portal. If you, want, you guys wanna look for it, it's in, in, the, uh, in the portal as well. It's in English and Spanish. We have a summary in English for you, um, for your convenience. In any case, without further ado, I would like to turn the, uh, the floor now to Ms. Carlene Leiden-Walker and thank her very much for her uh, participation today. Before she starts, you should also know, and I'm sure she'll mention it, but that the CIP is a 100% a supporter of this most important initiative. So with that said, Carlene, the floor is yours. I'll turn off my screen. Everybody turn off your screen so that you have the floor. Thank you, Carlene. Well, thank you so much, Jorge. I am honored to be here. I'm trying to get rid of this uh, little icon so I can go to my slideshow. I don't know why it's stuck, but it's stuck. Let's see if we can do and something else here. There we go. Voila. Can you see my slides? Yes, Eileen, we can see it. Excellent, wonderful. I want to thank uh, SIP, uh, OAS SIP for this kind invitation. They have been uh, part of the development of Carib Mapa. They saw the vision and uh, the opportunity that Carib Mapa presents for the Caribbean region and their dedication to the Caribbean um, and all of the Americas is unparalleled. What I won't be reflecting so much in today's presentation, because this really does focus on Carib MEPA, is what a wonderful partnership we have with OSCIP um, and Jorge and his team, because they have been instrumental in so many of our opportunities to, um, to really 
uh, spread the message about protecting the marine environment throughout the whole hemisphere. We partner on an art contest. Um, we partner on getting our materials translated. They have been so instrumental in getting our materials translated into Spanish, as well as distributing them throughout the hemisphere. And we're very grateful for that partnership. I also saw before we um, went into our little Zoom boxes that the co-chairman, my co-chairman in Carib Mapa, Raul Badalu, is on, the, on this webinar. And Raul, it's great to see you. He's in Trinidad and Tobago and has been an incredible uh, partner in getting Carib Mapa going. And I did see uh, at least one of my board members, maybe there are a couple of Namapa, Captain Anuj Chopra, um, and there are probably more, but I didn't see all the boxes. At any rate, I'm here to talk about a saving our seas through Carib Mapa, which is a solution to Caribbean pollution. Shipping connects uh, the globe and ships travel everywhere. Um, and shipping and ports are vital to a country's welfare. I always talk about the value proposition of the industry. More than 90% of all global trade is carried uh, by ship. Um, it represents a $14 trillion industry with over 100,000 ships over 100 gross tons. The average age of those ships are 21.7 years um, with the average lifespan is about 25. So it's creeping up there. And the total value of the world's fleet is a trillion dollars. So we are talking about a significant industry that provides incredible value to global society. Also, shipping is environmentally efficient, is one of the least environmentally damaging modes of transport, and particularly when you compare it to land-based industries, is a comparatively minor contributor to marine pollution from human activities. However, it's important to note that shipping is working hard to reduce its environmental impacts. Shipping is regulated by the International Maritime Organization headquartered in London. And when it comes to uh, marine pollution, it is pro it, it, protection of life at sea and the protection of the marine environment is through the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships called MARPOL. And we'll spend a lot of our time today talking about MARPOL, Marine Pollution Convention. But the conventions that are passed uh, by the international maritime organization, the re regulations that are brought forward by the IMO, which govern global shipping. The principal responsibility for enforcing these regulations exists with um, flag states, such as Bahamas, Cayman, Jamaica, D Dominica, etc. And then flag state enforcement is supplemented by what is known as port state control, where many of you are engaged whereby officials in any country which a ship may visit can inspect foreign flag ships to ensure that they are complying with international requirements. Port state control officers have the power to detain foreign ships in port that do not conform to international standards. If, and this is the big if that I really want to uh, focus on in our talk today, if the regulatory instrument is implemented. As we approach the reopening of the Caribbean, it's important to note that 86% of the countries in the Caribbean have ratified MARPOL, but only 25% of Caribbean countries have implemented MARPOL. That means that the Caribbean is vulnerable to environmental pollution and therefore economic loss. During normal times, Tourism plays a larger role in the Caribbean economy than any other world economy with 80 cents to the dollar coming from tourism. More than 700,000 jobs directly and 2.2 million jobs indirectly in the Caribbean relate to tourism. And the travel and tourism con total contribution to 2019 Caribbean GDP was $58.9 billion. But the environmental, social, and economic impacts of marine pollution in the Caribbean have been well documented over the last three decades and expose a very serious threat to the sustainable development of the region. MARPOL compliance exists at different administrative levels, depending on where we are. On the international level, as I mentioned, it's the IMO and UNEP through the MARPOL conventions. On the regional level, there are regional commissions and regional agreements. 
On the national level, you have government, national governments and national legislation. On the local level, it's provincial and municipal authorities and subordinate regulations. And on the port level, it's through port authorities and port regulations. And let's keep this schematic in terms of compliance in mind because it, as I said earlier, 86% have ratified, but only 25% have implemented. MARPOL Lennox One deals with oil, oil in the water. And all of us are aware of the impacts of the BP Gulf oil spill. And BP has now spent over $65 billion in court fees and penalties for the cleanup. And it had an impact of, on Gulf fishing and tourism of 3.5 to 4.5 billion per year. That's a big risk factor. Over a million metric tons of petroleum enters the marine environment annually from municipal and industrial sources, marine transport and natural, natural oil seeps and accidental oil spills. But I wanna note here that MARPOL is credited with making a substantial contribution in decreasing the amount of oil that enters the sea from marine transport. Waste uh, garbage in MARPOL 4, um, it's important to note that only 15% of wastewater, wastewater entering the Caribbean is treated. That means 85% of wastewater, it goes into the Caribbean untreated. Most wastewater goes directly into the sea, including pollutants such as nutrients, fecal matter, toxins, and pharmaceuticals. And wastewater pollutants are harmful to reefs and marine life and are also dangerous for people who will be exposed when they go swimming, snorkeling, fishing, and other tourist activities. MARPOL 5 is, has to do with garbage and marine debris. And there was a study in 2017 that if marine debris washed up on beaches reaches a level of greater than 15 items per meter squared, more than 85% of those beachgoers will look elsewhere for a vacation location, despite tourist loyalty to a specific area. Also, the likelihood of diseases in coral reefs increases from 4% to 89% when plastic is present. Plastic can also exacerbate ble bleaching. And if cor local coral reefs die, then profits made from those who utilize them for tourism will plummet. There was a study in 2014, South Korea experienced massive rainfall, causing more marine litter to wash up on the beaches of Goja Island. This resulted in a 29 to $38 million lost revenue to, due to lower tourism. On the flip side, in 2013, Orange County, California did a study on how marine litter affected beach attendance. And they found that a 75% decrease of litter reduction at six popular beaches generated over $52 million more benefits to Orange County residents in only three months. So there's the value of making sure that beaches are clean and that we put a lid on marine debris. But MARPOL is minimally into implemented in the Caribbean. As I said, with 86% of the nations in the wider Caribbean area ratifying MARPOL, but only 25% implementing them. Caribbean is vulnerable to environmental damage due to neglect, negligent actors and lack of regulatory implementation. And in 2017, there was an example of a Greek tanker that sailed through the Caribbean waters, but was caught in the US by the United States Coast Guard. And he was charged with discharging oily waste from the vessel's cargo tanks, bilges, deck spaces, et cetera. Um, but these discharges were not recorded. And in the same voyage, he ordered the crew members to throw over plastic, empty, empty steel drums, oily rags, batteries, et cetera. But these discharges were made at night to avoid detection and were not recorded in the garbage record book. It, they, the damage was done to the Caribbean, but because the Caribbean didn't have the right protocols, they couldn't um, and couldn't bring that uh, ship owner to justice, the US Coast Guard could. So this is what violations look like. This is what debris in the water, we've got air emissions and oil on beaches. This is what it looks like. I learned about this in 2017 when we held an implementing MARPOL in the Caribbean event in Cayman and recognized the lack of legislation and the need to engage in advocacy efforts for maritime to be a priority for governments. 
and, and recognizing that MARPOL is important for sustainability and resilience. And we began to develop partnerships as an important strategy for success and recognizing that training and education is a critical element as well as eliminating the barriers to implementation. The solution, the formation of CARIB MEPA, the Caribbean Marine Environment Protection Association. And I wanna to talk to you about what it offers. It represents an alignment of goals. It's a consolidator for marine environment issues and actions in the Caribbean. It acts as an umbrella for engaging industry, regulators, governments, conservation groups, educators, and more in protecting the marine environment. It also acts as a focal point for facilitating the implementation of MARPOL in the Caribbean, and it works to educate the public about protecting the marine environment. Um, we're basically, our, st our structure is an association of associations with NAMEPA and SIP OAS and the American Salvage Association, REC REMTAC, the Caribbean Shipping Association, CLIA, MTTC Caribbean, Port PMAC, um, Central American, you know, COCATROM and WEMAC, as well as CMU. But we have, we've identified a work program and I want to talk to you a little bit about it now. And that work program supports protection of the Caribbean marine environment through MARPOL and other tools. We're working to facilitate the development of a legislation and strategies for implementing MARPOL and response. We want to support the development of a MARPOL training academy in the Caribbean, uh, facilitate a program for identifying pollutionally, potentially polluting wrecks and prioritizing them in the region, participating in the development of regional waste compliance as well as disposal strategies, including a waste to energy program where you can take this waste and turn it into energy for countries, as well as educating the public with beach cleanups, school education projects, art contests, and more. In terms of MARPOL and um, increasing the capacity to implement uh, MARPOL in the Caribbean, um, we're talking about a MARPOL introductory webinar and recognizing that there is going to be an increase in shipping once again, which increases um, environmental pressure. Um, we're looking for raising the MARPOL ratification and which is incomplete in the Caribbean and implementation. We need to eliminate the barriers to this imp implementation and identify specific Im implementation and enforcement challenges. What we want to do is have a webinar which reintroduces the topic of MARPOL, refreshes and validates information from the poll that was conducted by CARAMEPA, Hudson Analytics and OAS SIP last fall, prioritize specific MARPOL topics and identify interactive workshop demand for such a webinar and workshops. It will be about 90 minutes long at no cost to the participants and it'll be a facilitated process led by world-class experts. We'll, it'll feature speakers with significant regulatory, legal and industry ex expertise and also feature regionally relevant success stories with MARPOL. We also want to uh, uh, address and advance the cause of wreck risks. There are nearly 300 known large wrecks averaging 5,800 gross tons in the Caribbean region that, may, that should be of concern. 80% of these wrecks are World War II related and at least 90% 90 are at least 50 years old. These are potentially polluting wrecks that are in the region and could release toxic materials. Caribbean wrecks may contain uh, from 151,000 to 1 1.2 million uh, metric tons of oil and other hazardous materials. And these potentially leaking wrecks threaten valuable tourist economy, ecological resources and fisheries with 70 and recognize too that 70% of the population lives along coasts and tourism supports more than 50% of the income. We estimate that $53 billion to $74 billion of tourism economy is at stake. And that, the program that we're talking about is a CRISP, Caribbean Risk Analysis, which will provide rigorous means to identify the wrecks with the highest potential risk that may require further study or action, 
It provides a process to prioritize these wrecks for proactive contaminant removal operations. It quantifies potential impacts and costs for cost-benefit analysis. It identifies sensitive ecological and socioeconomic resources at the greatest risk for protective strategies and prioritization. And there's an overall risk assessment process which allows for local and regional stakeholder involvement. Another area that we're engaged is, is waste, uh, port waste uh, compliance strategies. And one thing that we cannot have is what is noted here, which is taking the waste off of vessels and dumping them in landfills or unregulated facilities. We cannot have this happen in the region. What we need and what we're working towards in terms of compliance strategies are well monitored well-managed uh, port reception facilities that you can be assured are managing the entire process of the uh, compliance with MARPOL on port waste, as well as the eventual um, handling and disposition of those wastes. So this is good. We're also involved with waste management strategies in working with uh, waste energy, where the feedstock is municipal solid waste as the primary feedstock. And again, project size depends on the municipality's um, solid waste. What comes out of this program is electrical energy will be the power offtake. And you know, in terms of siting, how big a facility do you need? Again, it depends on a feasibility study based on how much municipal solid waste you're generating. And so will the costs for the project. Again, um, another benefit is that there are, are, is financing available for these projects. So whether you're a port or a municipality or a country and you're interested in waste to energy projects, these projects also have financing available. So what kind of waste streams are suitable? Um, you've got municipal solid waste, industrial waste, tires, medical waste, mixed brush, electronic waste, biomass, construction waste, and auto um, fluff. What is not uh, eligible um, is the high moisture waste, such as biomass. What are some of the benefits of these waste energy programs? Reducing landfill and landfill operational costs. You're producing renewable clean energy. You're creating jobs and your, the, the landfill will continue operations, but with reduced intake of waste, therefore extending its life cycle, and landfill materials not suitable for gasification will still be landfilled. And then there's educating the public. And we have numerous materials for beach, learning about beach cleanup, school education projects, art contests, and more. We use now NAMEPA's materials but it's deployed through WEMAC, the Women in Maritime Association Caribbean, throughout the Caribbean. We have our educators guides to marine debris, uh, which are available in English and Spanish. And these are kindergarten through 12, 12th grade lessons that focus on STEM and ocean literacy. And they're also aligned to next generation science standards and goes into sources of debris and ways to reduce debris and data collection and how to run beach cleanups themselves. We have our education on the marine environment, um, which talks about marine mammals and it has immersive lessons on ocean health, acidification, exploration, and the marine industry and inspires students to take action. We have our marine industry learning guide, which encourages students to explore marine uh, jobs and the marine industry as a possible career. And we've got hands-on lessons on buoyancy and ship operations and careers, and it fosters an appreciation for the maritime industry and its community. We've got our 10 ways to, um, you can save our seas and eight ways you can use less plastic. And these are uh, you know, really practical ways to reduce marine litter and marine debris. We talk about the plastic problem, but also finding solutions. We have our, do you know where your litter is available in English and Spanish? Um, and it's exactly where you left it. We developed, we've distributed that in partnership with the Coast Guard and SIP, OAS. And it's a visual representation of decomposition rates of 
garbage and ways to take action. We organize beach cleanups and we've done a, a number in the Caribbean, including one at the WISTA annual conference, international conference in Cayman. We have our MARPOL compliance handbook and MARPOL materials on how you can achieve compliance. But this really is an imperative for the region. And that's what CARAMAPA is working towards, developing and implementing legislation to enact MARPOL in the region, building capacity for managing waste streams for the region, addressing the potentially polluting and aging wrecks in the region, educating the public about protecting the marine environment, supporting the development of MARPOL Training Academy in the region, and identifying resources to support these efforts. And some of those resources could be the Caribbean Development Bank, the US Department of Justice MARPOL penalties, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank Foundations, reverse funding carbon trade, and others. So we launched CARAMEPA in 2019 when we were honored to be at, um, you know, surrounded by so many of our partners at the Shipping Associations of Jamaica's um, Caribbean Shipping Association event. But above all, I'm asking you today, are you interested in strategies to protect the uh, welfare of your people, your marine environment, and your country's revenue? If the answer is yes, then join us. An Association of Associations has now become a membership-based organization. And I'm happy to tell you that our first member is the Dominica Ship Registry, and we're happy to welcome them to our organization. So thank you very much for your time today. And I hope that you will join CARAMEPA as we educate, advocate, and activate. Thank you so much. Wow. Well, thank you, uh, Carleen, very, very much for this how shall I say that tour the force of uh, of uh, everything that you have? I I sometimes I'm uh, uh, you know pleasantly surprised that of the so many resources that Namepa has uh, you know in support of environmental stewardship and uh, so congratulations as you very well pointed out the CIP has been uh, uh, an initial supporter of Caribmepa from the very beginning, and we shall continue to be by your side and assist in any way that we can. We believe wholeheartedly in, 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 in that Caribmepa can bring together as an umbrella many of the efforts uh, to, to you know, care for the environment and, and enforce MARPOL and protect, protect you know, the, uh, the livelihood of our Caribbean member states in that way. So again, Carleen, thank you very much. Congratulations. Uh, uh, if, if anybody didn't know how much an AMEPA has to offer, well, now you do. And I would, um, we will include in our portal in the, uh, uh, we have both, we will put both the NAMEPA uh, links and the CARIMEPA link uh, as well, so that people can find it there. And I encourage everybody to join and to enlist yourself and do something it is really something uh, worthwhile for, for not only for your country, but eventually for, for the region itself. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much for the honor and the privilege of being with you today. Yeah, no, 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 no. Now, now the privilege is on our uh, good friend and, and, and known by everybody, uh, Mona Swoboda. Before Mona goes on though, I must uh, say that I've been told by the, um, organizer that we have uh, 32, 30 countries, hang on a second, um, 30 countries uh, signed up. So we are, the reach of this event is of interest to the region evidently. And so we'll try to do our very, very best. And with that, I'll uh, pass the floor to Ms. Mona Swoboda from the SIP Dream team. I know everybody knows Mona, but uh, here she is. You have the floor, Mona, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jorge. Um, thank you for the invitation um, and for having me. Um, and also, I just want to echo what Jorge said, Carleen, uh, congratulations on this wonderful initiative. I think you, you are bringing the right stakeholders on board and um, it's, it's wonderful to be part of it. And um, yeah, I thank you very much for, for sharing this with us today. So I will turn off my camera for the presentation.
And I would like to talk to you um, or, or share with you uh, one of our Caribbean focused initiatives, which is the project of improved disaster risk management for ports in the Caribbean. Um, Jorge introduced me. My name is Mona Soboda. I'm program manager at the SIP. Um, and um, I'm, I'm happy to share with you this, this significant and very important uh, project that we have begun, begun implementing. Next slide, please. Thank you. So before I get into the program, um, just a little bit of a background. Carlene has already shared with us the importance of the uh, maritime transportation for global trade. So um, we, we all know this number of over 30% of world trade go through maritime transportation and go through our ports. And in Latin America and the Caribbean, 95% of our exports uh, go through our ports in the region. So ports are not only um, substantial providers of employment and industrial activities, they also significantly contribute to national and regional development. They have a very unique, um, back to the, the first slide, please. They have a very unique operating environment. So um, almost all operations in ports, and if we could go back to the previous slide. Martin, por favor, la lamina. Gracias. <laughs> so they have, um, as I said, ports have a very unique operating environment. Almost all operations have an international element. Uh, multinational interest must be considered and managed. Uh, as well as very complex jurisdictions. For example, when a ship is in port, you, you know this better than me, you are the experts here. And um, despite this multitude or, or, or a multitude of international agreements and codes that we have and that must be complied with, there's, there's often a lack of full transparency when it comes to the different stakeholders. And all of these characteristics that I've mentioned, they, they can present a challenge for ports um, in crisis and, and in the event of a disaster or an incident. And all of these characteristics, then of course, have to be taken into consideration when we develop sound disaster risk management plans. We all know that uh, building resilience is critical for uh, business continuity, but not only business continuity, but also for the economic sustainability in our countries and, of course, the social prosperity. And consequently, the, the absence of updated disaster risk management measures uh, result in, in a negative influences on, on not only the economic and social development, but they can also uh, include the loss of lives, property, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and great tragedies. We saw uh, last year, when it's been a year, yes, when the world literally came to a halt uh, following the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, our ports around the world and, and in our region, they kept moving, providing essential goods uh, such as food and, and, and medication. So we saw that how ports respond to and recover from, from crises and incident, incidents has uh, wide implications for the societies in which they operate. Next slide, please. Awesome. So let's look at some of the regional challenges. In the Caribbean, natural and other disasters pose a particularly high risk to, to our ports, and they can have a, a big negative impact on, on the port operations. If we look, for instance, at the case of the Hutchinson's free port container port in the Bahamas, after Hurricane Matthew hit in 2016, uh, Hutchinson's free port was still operating at only 50 to 55% pre-Matthew in 2017. Um, but not only in terms of cargo movement and trade is the impact of disasters on our ports. I mean, Carlene mentioned in her presentation that in the region, uh, from every one U.S. dollar earned, 80%, 80 cents come from tourism. And so the ability to recover from disruptions in cruise ports, for instance, is, is fundamental. And that's one of the challenges currently that we're facing in the region is particularly uh, concerned with, with cruise port operations and continuity of operations in cruise ports. And while we have in, experienced an increase in the magnitude of severe weather and hurricanes in the region and, 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 and other uh, natural disasters, for instance, a, a couple of weeks ago with a devastating eruption of the volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 
the, the general disaster risk management in the region remains non-standardized or is non-standardized. However, it's, it's important for the region to have a common regional approach for increased regional and national resilience and in disaster response. Another challenge we, we can identify or we have identified are the limited resources in a single country. Uh, and I'm not talking only about financial resources, I'm also talking about physical space for, for storage of supplies and equipment, for instance. Um, and in many islands, as you know, we only have one port uh, that has the capacity, both physically and with regards to human resources, to operate in crisis. So it's, it's fundamental that this, this port um, res prepares, responds, and recovers well and efficiently from incidents. Next slide, please. So um, just briefly, we, we all know this buzzword, uh, resilience. So resilience is the, the capacity to recover quickly from disruptions and, and it is built through a comprehensive disaster risk management um, approach. It should be looked at as a cycle of continuous improvements with the effect of building resilience uh, of ports and also all related infrastructure. This is very important. We can't just look at our port in a silo. Uh, we also have to consider and integrate the related infrastructure. And some of the key aspects that should be addressed ahead of time, so, so uh, pre-event, um, are the following. One is um, a risk assessment uh, or, or in which, yeah, assess and prioritize risk. And this can be, for instance, by creating a risk registry um, in which you categorize risks, um, prioritize them, based on the likelihood um, of, of, of the risk and so on and so forth. So, so one uh, big component is, is a risk assessment. And then another big um, important aspect is the regional coordination uh, as done for instance, through organizations such as the DEMA or the Port Management Association of the, of the Caribbean. Um, and now of course, also through the SIP for our project. And that is another critical component is this common response system, this regional approach um, that of the disaster risk management cycle that can foster resilience. As I mentioned earlier, uh, given the unique regional correct characteristics of the Caribbean, disaster risk management and planning can't be or shouldn't be undertaken as an individualized process. We've seen in many instances that in the event of a disaster, response capabilities are often transferred to a neighboring island where uh, critical resources and capacities are, are more available. And therefore it is, it's crucial to develop a common response system and share information amongst each other through a regional approach. And this also means including all key participants of the disaster risk management cycle in, in training and exercises and, and establishing here clear authorities and jurisdiction. Next slide, please. Thank you. And this is uh, where we get into our, our project and we're so excited that earlier this year, we, we finally kicked it off. It, it was um, definitely, the design process was definitely um, not challenging, but um, we, we, we aimed at in, including the, the expertise and the knowledge of the different stakeholders. So we had consultation with with SEDEMA, the Port Management Association of the Caribbean, the Caribbean Shipping Association, and then our other partners, which I will talk to about later. So we finally started implementation um, earlier this year. And the, and the purpose of this project is to strengthen disaster risk management capabilities in port and maritime authorities of the Caribbean. And through that, reduce the impact of natural and other disasters on port operations. You can see here the list of beneficiary countries, and I'm excited to announce that through the MOU that we have with the Port Management Association of the Caribbean, we're also able to um, provide these benefits um, of this project and, and, and include also those non-sovereign island nations in, in this project. So we're very excited about that. Uh, an important component of this project will be the development of a model emergency operations plan for Caribbean ports. And this will be a document that it will be an open document that um, will, will be available for our ports in the region, of course, free of cost, and um, it will be adaptable to the, um, to, the, to the 
challenges and the realities of, of the different ports. Um, because as we mentioned earlier, we're not just talking about cargo ports, we're also talking about food ports that are so critical and, and important for the region. Next slide, please. Um, yes, Elvis. <laughs> they also include oil spills. I see here that the, the chat. So he was asking if other disasters also includes oil spills. So yes, that, that will also be considered. The um, project is being implemented in four stages or four project phases. Um, we are currently implementing phase one and two. And for this, we have um, engaged uh, the maritime consultancy Hudson Analytics. Many of you know them here. So we have um, formed a group of experts um, and, and we're thrilled to be working with them and we're currently implementing phase one and two. Phase one is um, the assessment, the risk and capabilities assessment, which I also mentioned earlier is, is an important component of the disaster risk management cycle. We are currently doing a um, comprehensive re review of both the natural and other hazards that have the potential to threaten or disrupt operations and ports, um, and also um, analyzing port vulnerabilities and capacities for disaster risk management. And um, we're, we're doing a review here of existing, existing emergency response plans in the Caribbean. And we have also just last week launched a disaster risk management assessment uh, survey, which was prepared by our expert team from Hudson Analytics. And um, it has been shared with the leadership of the port authorities in the Caribbean and also them disseminated uh, by our partners at PMAP. And um, I invite you to take the survey. Uh, if, if you haven't received it, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to send it out to you. And to those who um, have already answered the survey, thank you very much. Uh, it, it will help us um, with a more informed approach uh, for the project implementation. And uh, it, it also has a, a training component, uh, which will then help us a better target the, the training um, phase of the project. And then phase number two, um, which we expect to be completed in July, so relatively soon, is the um, draft of the model disaster response plan, which will be available to you all, um, as I mentioned earlier. And then phase three and four are um, probably the most, most important chunks of this project, and that is the training, as well as regional simulations and drills. So we will have here a, um, a focus on regional workshops. We're currently trying to figure out if, if we'll, we will do a, a hybrid um, version of in-person and online training, depending on, on of course, the, the, the pandemic and the um, restrictions there. But um, we will conduct four regional workshops um, in co cooperation with our strategic partners in which we will train uh, train the plan, um, but of course also give give um, more in depth training on disaster risk management in general. And then we will um, test the effectiveness of the model disaster response plan to to also be able to identify areas of improvement through uh, regional simulations and drills in two pilot ports. Um, but those those two phases will um, will be launched. Uh, later this year or early 2022. So I will keep you posted on that. Next slide, please. And um, these are our partners, institutional and financial support um, has been received by these organizations. I would like to highlight that the government of Italy and the government of the United States have um, both contributed over uh, $100,000 each for this important project. And um, we're, we're very grateful for their commitment in the region and for their generous contribution to this important project. And um, we are also, of course, uh, thrilled and excited to be working with our partners in the region. And um, this is really meant to be a Caribbean, not only a Caribbean focused project, but a Caribbean centered initiative. So um, that's why the support from Sedima, CSA, a PMAC um, are, are, are fundamental. So we're, we're, we're very grateful um, that we have this, this support from these institutions. Next slide, please. Um, and before I let you go, uh, and, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have later, I just wanted to um, leave you with some takeaways. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this, this common approach really requires for um, building and maintaining relationships. So 
it's critical to know, uh, hopefully, on a first name basis, who your counterparts are in the event of a disaster. Um, we say this often, a, a disaster or a disruption an incident is not the time to be exchanging business cards. We, 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 we should build these relationships. We should identify our partners in the event of a disaster um, pre-disaster and maintain these relationships and this is important post-disaster. Um, even when responding through, through regional stakeholder management, uh, considering the immense challenges the world is facing in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, who of us here is, is truly prepared to effectively respond to a disaster while managing and mitigating a health crisis? Um, I think the answer here is that it is extremely challenging. Um, I, I, I want to mention in this context that um, we are in awe of the efforts um, by the St. Vincent and the Grenadines government who have done an exceptional job in, um, in the response to the eruption of the volcano in the midst of this pandemic. So, um, but this is, this is really a challenge. So we have been presented with, with challenges in, in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic that we didn't, um, we didn't expect to, to ever be facing. So um, this, this brings us to another critical aspect of port resilience and disaster management, and that is sustainability. That means we have to develop, develop mechanisms that allow for response to prolonged interruptions and over an extended period of time, which is the scenario we're currently facing in the COVID-19 crisis, and this, this must also include mitigating the physical and mental exhaustion of our staff and court officials in time of crises. And that's an important aspect here. And when we understand disaster risk management as an investment rather than an expense, uh, port resilience can be significantly improved. And you see here, um, th this is especially important when we address our leadership, for instance, for budgeting. You see here uh, the FEMA assessment that assess that for every dollar spent in preparedness, $5 are saved in future losses. And along with these uh, investments and financial resources comes the updating or developing of sound emergency response plans, um, which, which is the goal of our project. And finally, and this is the most important component, uh, all resources within the disaster risk management cycle must be aligned with capacity building and training. We can have the most elaborate, robust, and complete emergency response plan on paper. But if we do not train our most important assets, which is our human resource, then we won't be successful in our preparedness response and recovery efforts. And with that, um, I next slide, please. I leave here our contact information. Uh, please feel free to, to reach out, to shoot me an email. Um, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer your questions later on. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Mona, uh, again, for, uh, I think, um, a, what a great presentation. We love this project. This is something that is close to our hearts, as, as many of you in the, in the audience know, because this is not the first time that we presented. I have to emphasize the, uh, the assistance that we have uh, obtained uh, for this project from the government of Italy. Uh, who was the first uh, one to believe in it, and, and they gave us uh, uh, funds uh, to the tune of uh, uh, 100,000 euros, I believe. And then, obviously, we continued in our fundraising and found support in the United States of America, who also chipped in with a similar amount. And, uh, and that's gotten us to start the project. And like Mona said, number one, uh, phase one and two, we're currently trying to reimagine Phase number three, the training to see if we can make it more effective somehow. But at, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to need the collaboration of, of all of you. Otherwise, it, it'll never work. Those surveys, please shoot Mona an email if you haven't gotten it so we can get your input into it. Uh, again, Mona, thank you very, very much. Uh, any questions that you guys might have, um, uh, please shoot them as well. And, uh, and, and, and in the portal, somebody asked about the presentations. They will be in the portal um, of, uh, the, of the CIP as uh, so of today, later on, uh, Carlene's presentations, Mona presentation, and, and what I'm going to present now, as well as the guide itself, will be uh, in the portal. So thank you again. Uh, um, Martin uh, and Real ID, would you please start me up on my presentation? 
uh, what I'm going to do, uh, like um, uh, I am going to talk to you about this guide. Uh, the thing is, uh, and it's important high point that I did not write it. We had, of course, an expert writing, but in that case, uh, the, the, what we are, I'm going to talk about really is um, I'm going to present what he presented in a way. So uh, excuse me, because I am really not the expert, but I'm trying to try to do my best. What we're going to go to is, is two points. We're going to first go through the guide for environmental certification reports. And then you have to know that this is a guide that establishes parameters for the uh, elaboration or the drafting of sustainability reports, which would be the second part of, of this presentation. Um, well, the former is talked about a lot, it, it really very little is known. And in the last few years, we have had various ports that have done sustainability reports. So we're getting more information on that. But regardless, we are very far away from achieving, um, you know, a critical mass of ports that, are, that, that, that do sustainability reports and that have uh, uh, sustainability practices. This guide here is important that I know is a consultation tool. And it is not an exhaustive consultation tool. There are many more options and many other ways of doing things, but you will find here quotes from diverse sources regarding mechanisms for environmental certifications, as well as the norms that create those reports. So it is important again to remind you that this is a consultation tool and then it, cons it contains information. It's about a hundred pages long, I gotta tell you. So it is, it is meant to be read from start to finish and and to, for you to take from it what you, what you deem necessary for your uh, an improvement of your port. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm, going not go I'm not going to really delve into the guide because it's, it's very long and I, we don't have the time, uh, but I'm just going to try to explain to you over the next 20 minutes what the guide has. Um, it provides a portfolio of selected port environmental management or green best practices as, as they're known. Uh, it's important that I remind you that because this uh, guide was prepared by a Latin American for the Latin American public, it is uh, uh, the examples you will find are Latin American, but we have tried to include and will try to include English speaking examples and especially in the Caribbean if, if available. So uh, next slide, please. So this is the agenda. This is what we're, we're going to go really quickly, the critical elements of environmental management ports the catalog of green port management, certification 14001, echo ports and others, commercial benefits and, and other benefits. Next slide, please. Um, and, um, you know, successful experiences, again, in Latin American ports with the ISO 14001 and, and more of the EMSA, uh, then the global reporting or GRI initiative for sustainability reporting guidelines. This is really, the standard I think that we found that, that, that is, is, is the one. And then of course the benefits of that. And then we'll go into some examples and again, some useful, useful uh, references. So next slide, please. We'll now address some of the critical elements for environmental management and ports. And, and you can see in the next slide, we're gonna, we have identified four. Uh, please, next slide, thank you. And uh, here we go in general there is a need for a port first to have an environmental policy that comes out from senior management and that denotes a commitment for environmental management and the promotion of sustainable development that then translates into an environmental program with concrete actions and with adap adaptation or preparation. And then comes the capacity building part and training to finally establish or implement a port environmental management system. So this is, this is sort of the logic that this follows and you know, you, you'll you have time to read on that. The next slide, thank you. Uh, nowadays they, are, they have two norms that, that, that are kind of related. One of them is the ISO 14001 and the other one is the one next to it, which is the environmental uh, uh, management system. So uh, as you can see, to understand how they relate to one another, we have to look at the parameters shown here in this table in a way that they're parable. You can click again if you want. Uh, thank you. In terms of application, for instance, they are applicable to all types of organization and initial environmental uh, evaluation or revision is required. So in the first case, it is recommended that while the second is required. Does that make sense? The, uh, the, the recommendations for this requirement? 
Next slide. Uh, we are now going to briefly go through a little catalog of report management of best practices. Uh, so go ahead, here we go. Um, let, in fact, can you go back to the blue slide, to the one that I had the, so I forgot to say something. Uh, I'll go back another one. Thank you. All right, so here we, you can see that one of the things is that in, in the first case, in the ISO, there is no periodicity, while the second one requires periodicity every three years. And in this way, we can, you know, it's, it's, it's up to you really where you want to get that from. Now, if it is required to have an environmental declaration, the validity, and finally, then at the end of that, you're required to have a registry. So as you go through these elements, uh, it'll help us understand what the scope of, of the two different uh, norms are but you're welcome to follow either one. All right, now let's go to the, uh, to the, uh, um, the next one. Here we go. Here we go. All right, so, so what the guide does is, is it does a specific analysis of the common general impacts related to port activity for every one of the environmental components that were selected. And you can see some of this is in the screen. We established the component, the impact, and in the last column, the third column, a brief description. What was intended here is for ports and terminals to analyze if they are generating these environmental impacts, which are commonly generated when there is no environmental management. I'm talking about the landscape. I'm talking about the flora. I'm talking about the fauna. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm also uh, talking about the water, the air, the soil. Every one of these components, and let's pick one, let's pick the air, it's known it is known the impact in ports is usually in the form of gases or increased concentration of particular matter. The gases might come from the cruise ships or the cargo ships. The particular matter might come from the cargo uh, coming and going. However, these components are further described in the guide and they are important because they will give us a reference to us to what the status of, of each one will be. So again, this is just a brief overview of what the, of what the, of what the guide has. I'm, I'm not, trying to explain this to you, but just mention in it so that you take interest and go look into it. Next slide, please. All right, now best practices. We did here the, 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 the inverse exercise by identifying what the best practices of certain Latin America port terminals were. Also related to each of the potential environmental impacts. For instance, as you can see in this slide, the practice of atmospheric, no, the next, before. No, antes, antes, I, 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 like this one with, with atmospheric emissions uh, control, we identified a series of commonly developed actions by Latin American ports that seek certain specific results. For example, in this case, we selected environmental surveillance systems of air quality and particular matter. Some ports even measured carbon footprint, for instance. Others, especially those associated with mining activity, have airtight seals and in freight trucks. And so besides the atmospheric emissions, the best practices are reflected in the guide with actions and concrete and expected results, not only in terms of atmospheric emotions, next slide please, but also in terms of, you know, all, all the things that we just said, noise control, the next one please. Uh, water practices, best practices to prevent water pollution, next one, energy. For example, uh, an action in terms of energy would be a policy decreasing energy consumption. Some ports have implemented a management system for energy efficiency under the norm ISO 50001, so 50001. Uh, other ports are measuring the carbon footprint and even more advanced are not only measuring the carbon footprint, but also compensating for that property by offsets in other things. So uh, next slide, please. The same is true for landscape management. Next, uh, for sea, for, for seawater, not, not just water, but, but seawater. Next, soil waste management, which is a big problem for many of us. And lastly, uh, soil. So the, these best practices, the, the hope is that as you look at them in the guide, you will be able to, to, to you know, glean some inspiration for that in order to you report and, and for you to improve your, your practices as well. Next slide. All right. Um, 
I'm trying to, again, just provide the elements that help you understand how the guide is, is, is made up and the mm -hmm. architecture of, of the guide in such a way that this is a tool for literally self-consumption. So each one of you guys will be able to identify what situation your port is in. Now, in regard to the certification, the ISO 14001 or EcoPorts even, we'll go ahead, next slide please. So as you read these, uh, these, uh, this slide and these benefits, I will start by making reference that follows the certain benefits that have to do with environmental protection using the prevention or mitigation of environmental impacts, fulfill legal obligation. It permits to control the way in which port operates. And this facilitates financial or operational benefits that are not obvious at first, but that have increased in importance as your sustainability improves. It also achieves to successfully communicate environmental information to all stakeholders. So this is why this one is very important. Next slide, please. Did we, did we move slide? Here we go. Um, now, in, in, in the EMS slide, in relation to the, this is the environmental management system. It is important to point out that this norm permits uh, to guide and manage the continuous performance of a terminal or, and the objectives include the establishment of environmental management system. The systematic and objective evaluation of this system, the dissemination of the information, and the open and permanent dialogue with the public and relevant stakeholders. So you'll see here, as you, as you look at it, you know, different components uh, you know, the, that, that, that bring it together, the plan, the do, the don't. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, the advantages of just like the, the 14,001 uh, ISO, uh, th this one has certain advantages and you can, advantages you can see here where some of the objectives are, uh, uh, you know, the establishment of the environmental management system, I just said, and the systematic objectives, I just said this. Uh, so please, uh, next slide. Here we go, the advantages. Uh, so as you can see, you get, you, you get a set of environmental benefits you get a set of benefits of leadership and corporate image. It is well known that if your port or terminal is known as a green port or a green terminal, you will be more competitive. You will get more business uh, and which relates to the economic and social benefits that are, that are there on, on the screen. So next slide, please. All right, these stages that you see here are also further developed in the guide. This is just you know little snippets of, of, of what they include the initial environmental review, the implementation of an environmental management system or EMS, uh, which could be the ISO 14001, for instance, and then comes the environmental declaration, which is important here because where the environmental beneficial, well, sorry, because here is where the environmentally beneficial management is identified as well as the commitments. And then that's followed by a verification and a registration. Next, next slide, please. Uh, now, people, a lot of people talk about eco ports and, and what eco ports is and, and how they certified and, and the environmental management system, eco ports, is an, 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 uh, it's an initiative that, that focuses on the port sector. And its objective is to increase awareness through cooperation and knowledge exchange between the ports. So the, what they have is a peer review system uh, that, that's, that's the purse, that's the peer review system in which other ports uh, uh, sort of grade each other in best practices. Please, next slide. Um, here are uh, five steps that were identified uh, as steps for uh, being certified by eco ports. Of course, you have to register uh, you know, you have to uh, com uh, completing, like I said, the self-diagnosis method for, for the peer review, which is the third step. And then there'll be an audit and expectant. And then after that, you submit a report. And if it passes, uh, you will be certified as a PERS, as a peer review system at the port's port. This, as we know, is very or more common in Europe. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. So uh, now we'll, 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 we'll talk a little bit about the commercial and social environmental benefits that were briefly addressed from becoming a green port. Uh, next slide, please. 
So here you got them. You got four. You got reduction of waste, cost, and increased efficiency on the one side. Two, uh, timely compliance with legal requirements and other regulations. Three, strengthening reputation. And four, information engagement of stakeholders. And here I would say there are savings in time. There are savings in cost. There are economies of scale. There is that increased reputation uh, that, that the port has or the terminal has as being green, as being com committed to the environment. Next, please. Now we'll talk a little bit about uh, successful experiences here and there. So uh, next, please. Thank you. So uh, in terms of successful experiences with ISO 14001 or EcoPorts, we have, again, this was a, uh, a task uh, made by a Latin America for initially the Latin American ports, but uh, the information here is so vital to all of us that the SIP went with the trouble of translating it and, and, and we offered it freely. It's offered freely for, and we encourage all of you to download it and, and read it and, and, and you know, we'll, 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 we'll be there for you. If you have any questions, just reach out. But here's some uh, examples. So again, this is not an exhaustive example, but these are some of the examples and of, of Latin American ports that have either ISO or eco ports. And you read these on the screen, plus the ones that are in the little, in the little square there, which uh, include Santa Marta and Colombia and Puerto Ventanas in Chile and, and other ports. Uh, next slide, please. All right, now we get to the Global Reporting Initiative of Sustainability Reporting Guidelines. Now, when we were giving this, uh, um, uh, presentation in Spanish, somebody asked, so what should I get? Should I work on the ISO 14001? Should I work to get uh, EcoPorts uh, certify me or someone else? Or should I try and participate in the GRI? And, and the expert said, your best, you, the highest thing is this, is, is, is the global reporting initiative by sustainability reporting guidelines, which we'll see in a minute. Next slide, please. So, so this guideline is very important because we're talking about ports who have taken it a step further and by reporting and not simply having a certification. The report generates a commitment from the port to improve not only the environmental elements, but also the social and economic elements that come along with it. All of this is regulated by the GRI, which is an independent nonprofit organization that was founded in, in 97, as you see. So next slide, please. The guide itself was published in 2016, but its application began in 2018. And these standards are very important. It has two modules, the universal and those that are topic specific, which refer to economic, environmental, and social topics respectively. And you can see that there. Next slide, please. Uh, all right, the reporting principles and core content are divided into those that define the report content and then those that refine the report quality. The guide emphasizes the fulfillment of these principles and inclusion of interest groups, sustainability context, amongst other things. And it, it, it tends to be really accurate and, and balanced and, and transparent. And that is sort of the point of this. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits uh, that we've seen? You know, we've seen each one has kind of the same, really, uh, benefits, and they, they begin to pile up, don't they? So next one, please. So here you, you see when you do these uh, sustainability reports that you have clearly identified internal benefits uh, and external benefits for, uh, you know, for, for the port or terminal who is doing this, this uh, global reporting initiative and, and global, uh, I mean, on sustainability reports. So they're clearly uh, identified. Next slide, please. And I know I'm, running long, I think, but we're almost done. Bear with me, bear with me, we're almost done. So successful experiences of this reporting in Latin American ports. And needless to say, any of you guys want to reach out to any of these ports, all you gotta do is give us a call, drop us an email, and we'll be happy to act as a bridge uh, and put you in touch with these ports to, to, in order to, to get some uh, you know, lessons learned and, and whatever you want and whatever you need. We'd be happy to do it as part of our job to facilitate that. Next slide, please. Uh, so here, I, as we said, there's some successful experiences 
of sustainability reporting in Latin American ports. And you'll see Santa Marta, which was in the other one, and Terminal Pacifico in Chile. And again, any and all of these that you might be interested in accessing to, to see why they did it or how they did it or, or you know, what path they took, we'll be happy to, um, to, to do that for you next. Thank you. Now, here's some of the internal benefits of, of these. And in the interest of time, remember this presentation, as long as the guy, as long, I mean, as well as the guide itself, uh, are available and will be available in our portal, which is www.portalcip.org. And you can find it there. Next slide, please. Uh, the report naming, oh, this, this thing about the report naming is, uh, it's interesting that, 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 that you can name your report in different ways. And thank you, Mona, for putting the portal on the chat. Next slide, please. Uh, generalities and outstanding aspects of the reports. Well, you can see here the mission of values, uh, you know, their certifications. Like I said, these reports go beyond that, you know, the corporate governance of practices. You know, their clients, their collaborators, or management. This is all mentioned in the guide. Go ahead, next one, please. Uh, again, there's a community engagement component and the, of course, the environmental management and, and all these uh, ports and terminals that have 14 things, uh, uh, 14,001 uh, will, will appear there. So we invite you to, to you know, some reports. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, dedicate uh, some reports dedicate a special section to community engagement and, and others include aspects of energy efficiency uh, or you know whatever else they're doing so so they go like I said a little bit beyond the mere certification or or compliance with ISO 1401 and finally some useful references uh, next slide please uh, here you go you know the Latin American organizations that perform or provide advice in this, uh, in this, in the 14001. And, and then there's other in, uh, international organizations there that you might uh, want to access. We are uh, in the quest of uh, obviously beyond the co-ports itself in finding English resources to be included here. And if you find them and want to share them with us, we welcome that. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, and then here are some references for the Environmental uh, Management System Certification, uh, which, which you might want to you know, explore and grow. Green Marine, for instance, is in Canada. Rideship uh, is uh, Australian-based, but in the Americas, they're based in Houston, and they, of course, have uh, another type of environmental collaboration. So last slide. Um, then, and then... For EcoPort certification, in case you're interested in that, here are some uh, resources for that. You can uh, obviously contact uh, Herman Journet uh, directly or in, in this side of, of the pond, uh, Rafael Diaz Ballard from the American Association of Port Authorities is their, their uh, quasi representative, and, uh, and you, you uh, are welcome to contact, uh, contact him, of course. Last slide, I believe. There we go, that was the last slide. So we can stop uh, sharing my screen. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for withstanding that the whirlwind of presentation. Uh, it is a long guide. Like I said, it has like a hundred and something pages on it. It is, it is a consultation tool. Uh, and, and, and I have to tell you, when I first started looking at it, I don't know, but the more I look at it, the more I love it, the more I understand it. And, and I'm sure that if, if you take the time to look at it, it will help you certainly identify little things here and there that can make a big difference. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. I now open the floor uh, for questions to our panelists who have been very patiently waiting for me to finish. And again, I'm sorry, I've never really had to give anyone else's presentation before. And it was a little... <laughs> weird but especially in another language but uh, uh i i hope i didn't do the service to to uh francisco gonzalez's work so i'm i don't know if we have some questions i see carlene has shared some information today. yes i was i was gonna uh, just point out what carlene shared here and that is that namepa has the maritime sustainability passport for esg so 
Thank you, Carlene, for sharing that. And I'm sure that uh, Carlene is also a resource there that um, you, you have all the expertise that can, can also uh, guide us to other resources. And then I just briefly, before we, we take some questions, I just wanted to, um, there was one question in the chat that Jorge already answered, um, which was about um, if, if this project is um, simply only for the Caribbean uh, countries, member states of the SIP OAS. And while that is correct, the um, model emergency operations plan will be available on our portal. So it, it will be available uh, to you um, as well as the training materials. Um, they will also be available to you. So um, in fact, we have some funds there to, to translate also. So you will have access to those materials, uh, COC. I saw this, this question came from the Panama Maritime Authority. So I just wanted to, to point that out. Excellent. Yes. In fact, uh, like I said, the Caribbean basin countries such as Panama and Central America, Colombia, Venezuela and Mexico uh, have been invited to take part of, of, of this project again, because it's designed for uh, those man-made or especially those natural hazards that really plague the, the, the Caribbean basin. So thank you, Mona, for clearing that up. Uh, thank you, Carlene, for giving us this resource. This is the one, one thing. Paul, please take note we are going to begin to include in the English part of the guide, this type of resources. And again, anyone looking at this from, you know, uh, Marita Kramp, hello, uh, and uh, Jorge Baracat and Andrew Baskin and Anush Chopra and uh, uh, any, you know, more, many, many people I know here that could contribute with resources. Uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot. I just put some of my friends on the spot, but uh, <laughs> we would love to get your input, your questions and your contributions in order to make this a more robust resource for everybody's benefit. And so I think we answered some of those questions on the fly, but I encourage um, uh, the audience to please don't, don't keep it in. Uh, there's, there's no dumb questions. And, uh, and we'd love to take them. And, and uh, I mean, in, in, uh, when we did this uh, exercise in, in, in Spanish, people uh, had uh, questions of a, of a more operative nature. How do I begin? Who do I talk to? Uh, what do I need? And, and so in, in, in the spirits of perhaps assuaging some of those doubts, you begin by getting your leadership involved. You begin by in, in selling the uh, sustainability practice to the leadership, which is not a hard sell. Most of your countries, most of the Caribbean Basin, we're all very, very mindful of the importance of environmental stewardship. And uh, when you add to, to, to these things, the um, collaboration of organizations such, such as Carib MEPA, which is specifically designed to address uh, some of these issues, uh, you know, more, uh, more, more, uh, the more the merrier, I think. And, and, and we can, but of course, all of these uh, things are, are really um, empty in, unless we get the collaboration from the, from the stakeholders, which, which, which is you. So both in the project uh, and the uh, disaster management project uh, it will be essential. And then of course, uh, the guide is there for everybody's consultation. It's already been uploaded. Bao, would you be so kind as to put on the chat the exact link for uh, for where the audience can access this guide in English? I would be very grateful for that, so that everybody can can uh, can have it and and access uh, the PowerPoint and the presentation in English. Um, so, Carlene, would would you, since I have no idea what the Maritime Sustainability Passport or ESG is about, would you mind telling me a little bit about that? Not at all. I'd be delighted. This is a project that NMEPA has been working on for the last four years be because we saw the importance of what started out as CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, and then morphed into ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance. Um, so we've been working on it for the last four years, and we launched it last June. Uh, the first company to go through it was Cargill. Uh, it is um, a program designed to look at six environmental pillars, um, six environmental, social, and governance pillars within organizations. So we look at uh, envir you know, environmental issues such as emissions and waste streams and um, 
you know, some of those technicalities. We look at the social in, in issues. What are, what are your diversity and inclusion programs? Um, what about uh, anti-theft, anti-money uh, laundering, et cetera? And that is all, that's in the governance side. But we're, we're looking at the three areas of ESG and providing, and, and so companies will submit to us their responses to our quite rigorous um, program. And if they attain, and, and then those responses are reviewed by an independent assessors. And if they attain a 60% or greater, then they receive their maritime sustainability passport. If that isn't achievable in the first go round, we, we also supply a toolkit for companies and organizations to improve on their, their metrics, on their measurements, um, so that we, we have those resources available so that they can come through it again, the program again. We sign an NDA, so if you don't you know, complete it the first time, nobody, nobody will know. Um, but we really feel it's important to get everyone uh, moving together in terms of these sorts of benchmarks. And we are the first measurement tool for the maritime industry. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's actually very, very interesting. And I think will be very useful, um, you know, uh, tour for co what, what you guys do is always very impressive. So congratulations. And, Thank you. and by the way, let's talk further late, later on about I saw so many more materials you guys have created and perhaps we could be of assistance as we were before in, uh, in translating some of these posters and some of these useful things, the 10 ways to make a difference, the eight ways to uh, uh, the plastic, uh, you know, perhaps we can continue to support NAMEPA and in this case, carry MEPA in, in that sense. Let's talk later about that. So that we Thank can you so much, Hori. You're always generous with the SIP's um, willingness to collaborate and add value. Thank you. Well, I'm generous with the team's time and effort because remember that the SIP is made up by, by a strong women team that I have the privilege to lead and, and be part of. So, uh, so it's, 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 we'll, we'll be happy to do it. Thank you. I'd be happy to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, I, um, I um, see not any more questions. Um, in, um, hang on, I need my glasses. It says uh, whether it would be worth to create the sustainability port page where port authorities can share their best practices. Okay, so this is a question that I put to the group and uh, a couple of responses would be appreciated. Uh, the idea is that we could have in our portal, in the sustainability management page of our portal, we could create a new page to feature uh, uh, sustainability practices of port authorities. And so that people can go and check and, 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 and we can do a clearing house and sort of group all these practices that uh, that would be useful for the region in one page. Um, you guys think it's a good idea? We can do it, and and you can send us your um, your uh, thoughts in an email. As you know, I'm going to type. Uh, well, you this is the uh, um, sort of the organizational email that you can uh, reach us at. And of course, everybody has my email, and if you don't have it, here it is. And you can just throw me an email thinking, yes, Jorge, we should do a page with those resources. And here's a couple of ideas. And don't be afraid to throw them in. Uh, or you can tell me, no, it's a very bad idea. And don't do it. <laughs> in any case, I would appreciate your response. We've arrived to the 2028 mark. Uh, this uh, was planned for, for now. So it's great that uh, we closed in time. I thought we were going to be a little late because of the so many slides I had. Uh, Carlene, would you love, there's, there's Roll saying something there on the chat. And Carlene, I'm gonna give you the floor for some final thoughts and goodbyes. Well, I do want to encourage all of you to take a look at joining us and our efforts with Care of MEPA. We started out being an association of associations, but now we are member-based and we would appreciate you joining us in our efforts. And uh, we should, we're expecting to have more news for you about the upcoming webinar, where we'll be talking about building capacity for developing MARPOL leg uh, legislation. 
Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation, for sharing uh, NAMEPA's wonderful resources, and we will, we will have more on that. And again, congratulations to CARIMEPA. We believe it's, 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 it's an important initiative and has our full support. Mona, uh, Linda, Valerie, uh, stay, a few final words there. <laughs> Thank you, Jorge. Um, and thank you, Carleen, again, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you also, Jorge, for your presentation. I know I know that was uh, was challenging because, as you said, this the screen guide is over 100 pages uh, as strong. So we, we really invite you to take a look at it. It's a wonderful tool. We're very excited that we were able to share it with you today. And um, if you have any questions regarding the project, the SIP project to improve disasters management capabilities in the Caribbean, Shoot Jorge an email, send me an email. We'll be happy to share more information. And I invite you again to participate in our survey as we're really trying to meet your needs and um, your feedback is fundamental in that effort. So, um, and thank you to everyone for participating. Well, thank you uh, for participating, Mona. And did there, your feedback, as Mona has said, I cannot emphasize that enough. If, if we don't get feedback, then, then we don't know how, how to proceed. We don't know where to go. We don't know which road to take. We need your input to, to guide us. Uh, as you know, the SIP is usually demand-based. We don't try and think what is needed. We are told what is needed by the port authorities so that we're always on firm ground. And on that, again, your suggestions are more, more than welcome. Thank you to the technical team, Martin Santillan, Este Oved from Real ID, as usually... As usual, wonderful, your support. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Sabina Pao from, uh, from the SIP Dream team, thanks again, as always, for your support. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, it's been a pleasure to share this 90 minutes with you. I wish you a very good rest of Thursday, and, uh, and I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. See Thank you, you for the next time. Thank you all. Thank you.